of the lessons that I think I can personally share, although I really am going to be 100% honest, I need reminding. Uh, and I wrote this and I think I need to, I need to print it, put it in my office in front of me every day because I, I do sometimes not follow this. And, you know, people tell you, you can have it all. You can have a career in science and you can raise a happy family. I say, yes, possible, but it's not easy. It really is not easy. Um, and I do think that there's some, some things that we need to, um, we need to remind ourselves about and, and also knowing that it's not easy is good because, uh, those who tell you, you can have it all, it can kind of invalidates the struggle that so many people go through right? and the struggle is real. So some of the things that I would uh, highlight is one, one is their support network, be it your friends, be it your colleagues, be it your family. Make sure you take care of that support network. Uh, or you can also have hired help. This can be a, this can be a nanny, this can be a kindergarten, this can be if you are if you live, if you're lucky enough to live in Kenya and Tanzania, you can you can have help that is hired. If you if you live in the UK, you might have to um have a kindergarten or um but having that support network, um, not everybody has their family or their parents able to support them, but you might be able to find Supports through other ways. Um, another thing is time management. Um, know where you want to go. And there's this quote from Paulo Coelho, which says, uh, and I might get this wrong. Um, it says, uh, no, uh, when you know where you're going, but go slowly because direction is more important than speed, right? And that's really true. Time management is when you um, not just manage your time for work. Right, and manage also that leave some time dedicated to whatever it is you enjoy to do. Um, that can be anything, um, and that also comes to um, doing things that you might um, you might some other others might perceive as uh, you know um, make you feel guilty. So don't let that happen. You know how sometimes you take care of yourself, and it's myself. Maybe it's just my very Catholic upbringing. I feel guilty about everything. So if I if I um, if I just do something to enjoy myself, I feel guilty. I think I should be working, or I should be doing something with my kids, or whatever. Let's we have to really try to not feel so guilty. We should just we should make sure that we are taking care of ourselves and we we are trying to do things that we that make us feel good because that is really part of of um, of the recipe needed for success. Right, for success, where we have to, we have to be whole. Um, and one thing that I tell some of my friends is that, yeah, because they look at me and they say, oh, but you, you know, you have a family and you're so happy and, and you have to work and so on. Well, I don't do anything very well. I'm still be very honest. There are many times where I think I don't do things perfectly. I often leave, um, and I might not um, do the presentation as well as I could have done it, for example, like this one, or maybe I have um, left something a bit to last minute, or I'll, at a family level, maybe I just won't cook dinner, I'll let somebody else do that. So really, um, we have to learn to forgive ourselves and, and, uh, and, and to realize that if we really do want it all, we're not gonna be able to have it all at the level that we would be able to if we only had one thing. You understand that you can't dedicate yourself 100 to it because otherwise you will if that is your if your expectations are so high it will drain you and you will feel you will not be able to, to be happy um then there are these 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 habits that sometimes we create that are, are not great and then um be it uh i don't know um certain people that we let into our lives or, or um or doing and it's unhealthy habits, uh, unhealthy eating. We try to really stay away from that because mm, although it feels good in the moment, that long run, of course, it's these are all detrimental to your to your well being. And um, one of the things that are really important is learning to say no. And and that is no, at, not just for work, but also for your friends. No, I don't feel like going. Tonight. I just feel like sleeping. Or no, I cannot write yeah. that I cannot be an editor on your journal because really unpaid work, I do enough of it. Just say no. And and that is these are well, these are all a list of things that I try to to guide myself through, but 
again, like, like I tell you, um, I often need reminders. These are things that I don't do very, very well. Um, but I do know that they are important. Um, and then I have a special message to um, the women. And, and, I, and I ask the men to please forgive me. Uh, um, I have a friend who tells me this. If a single mom cannot do it, nobody can. Um, I don't know if anybody... Um, you guys still hear me, so I just kind of stopped seeing you. Anita, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Um, it got a bit oh, choppy sorry. for a few minutes, but I can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to say that, um, you know, single moms are a force of nature. And of course, moms in general don't have to be single, but particularly a single mom, because they learn how to drive by themselves. Usually they are the driver, the cook, the prison warden, the the, the, the everything, everything in one package. And so if, if you want to, so this came about because we were talking about hiring somebody. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you think that uh, the older generation would hire a man. But maybe now the new generation will be biased to hiring a single mom. Because single mom, indeed, they can really do everything. But this is just a dream. It's probably not true. Um, but to the women out there, uh, first of all, choose who you work with. Uh, sometimes there are places that are, are not that are not great for women. Yeah? Um, I want you to aim high, be bold, and when somebody calls you a difficult woman, be happy because that means that you are you are getting there. You have achieved something. Women usually are labeled as difficult, and men are labeled as um, uh, assertive. Women will be labeled as um, as hysterical, and men will be labeled as confident. Or, so women really do get the, the short end of the stick. Um, so don't be afraid of being labeled because that means that you're doing something right. And there's a lot of unconscious bias out there. Um, people who maybe just assume things that okay, you're a woman, maybe they assume because you have a child, you don't want to travel or things like just things like that. So I would say that if you can call it out and say, listen, um, maybe that assumption is not right. Um, sometimes this isn't even badly and no bad intentions are, are there, but then that's what basically what unconscious bias is, is when you have no bad intentions, but mm, so these ideas are there because of the stereotypes that we have about each other. Um, it's really important to support other women. Sometimes women are their own worst enemies. Um, we really have to make an effort uh, um, to support other women. And that goes mm, consciously increasing your number of female mentees and students or um, making a particular effort uh, with with uh, supporting women. So say, for example, if you are in, and this is an example that happens to me, I sometimes have my master students graduate. And I tell you, every single time the panel is completely male. They're super, not a not the supervisory panel, because I'm the supervisor, but the, the, the examination panel. Well, at the end of the at the end of the panel, I always call this out. I say, "Why is it that you didn't find a woman? Why is it can't why can't why couldn't you add a woman?" And of course, so this sometimes I'll be able to laugh at this, and and I get labeled as uh, as difficult. Why why should why should I have to make that comment? I'm just a supervisor. But really, this is the type of things that we need to be calling out because it's not correct. And I think this happens more in Africa still than it does, for example, in the UK, um, because in, in the UK they have been systems put in place many, many places. Doesn't mean that, it make, that it's perfect, but I do see it, that uh, it happens a bit more here than it does in other places. And this really, it starts with the women calling it out and also to the men. The men can also call it out. It shouldn't just be women. Um, inclusiveness, I mean, it's something that sometimes a system, like sometimes the system is just geared in a way that it's not inclusive. And I give you an example. Let's say you are a mother uh, and you've done your three months of, um, of maternity leave and you come back and you're working as you're working as a scientist and you have to do something as their super as their supervisor or line manager i will be the first one to say bring your child if you're going to the field or i'll be the first one to say if you can't work from the office nine to five that's perfectly fine work from home um or or just make sure that you come to the office at the same time if necessary right so that type of inclusivity, sometimes the system does not support it, but as the, as the line manager, and I 
talk to you guys, maybe some of you are line managers, but well, you are not, but you will be one day. Make sure that you champion that inclusivity within your 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 own personal systems. And and if you are the person who is caring for someone, don't apologize for it because actually you're doing a really important job. So nobody people, I mean, this is something I would probably will agree that if you ask somebody who's a stay-at-home mom, they will say, I'm just stay at home. Why is that just? You are doing an incredibly important job. So if on top of that, you're also working as a scientist or you're working uh, or studying to do a PhD, then really you are a champion. And with that, um, I'm going to end this. Um, probably. Um, I think I've taken quite a lot of time already. Sorry, by a three or seven here. But um, this is just some of the people I work with, a wonderful team in Kenya. Um, and if I'm really happy to answer questions, be it about science, be it about anything else. And so back to you anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mata. That was very, very, very in inspiring. And I appreciate the fact that you not only walked us through your science journey and told us about the interesting research you're working on or you worked on before, but you really humanized your story, you humanized your science journey, and I'm sure many of us could relate to several aspects of the non-technical scientific paths. Because at the end of the day, we are all human. And as much as we are scientists, we also need to take into account other human factors that come into play in our science journeys. And I appreciate that you are vulnerable enough and open to share that. So um, it's time for questions. If you have any questions, raise your hand or put them in the chat and I will read them out on your behalf. And I will kick off the question and answer session by asking, um, um, I'd like to, take you back to where you mentioned that initially you trained in veterinary medicine and specialized in small animal surgery and at that point you did not really think much into going into a career in science or global health and then you had the accident and that was a pivot and then you had to like change your career from surgery because of that and I'm just wondering at that point in time um, the martyr at that time how how difficult or how easy was it for you to pivot in that way and go into an a different slightly different field and maybe what kind of support did you get if any during that time? Thanks, Anita. Um, well, first of all, veterinary medicine is a very broad um, it's a very broad course, and it was just, I think now it might be different, but at that time it was a six year long course six year long degree. So I really had a lot of uh, a lot of fun. And I had a good foundation. So when I moved from small animal surgery into I first initially moved into parasitology, I can't say it was tremendously hard. It was it was uh, doing the PhD itself was hard, but the transition wasn't too hard. Now one thing I didn't maybe I didn't become clear was that although I had chosen to be to work in, in veterinary in small animal surgery, I wasn't happy. I chose it because, well, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but and it was something that I knew would bring some money, right? So, you know, if you're going to be unhappy, at least be unhappy with some money in your pocket. But um, I wasn't happy because the idea of taking care of Fifi's and Lulu's wasn't really, um, I don't know if I, it sounds arrogant, but it just wasn't impactful enough. I wanted to have impact. And so I wanted to do something that would be, you know, improve the world. and. And that's when uh, going into into global health, and maybe because of the passion that I found in it, was, I can't say it was that hard, but the thing, um, I, most the hardest part was really convincing those around me that I had done a good decision. I mean, nobody ever supported me on this. They all thought, wow, you're leaving the career of surgeon and to go into, you know, protecting cattle with a, a net in Ghana. A lot of people really thought I had lost my mind. Um, so I think I, I trusted my instincts and I just went through with it. But yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you answered it well. And I'm interested I'm interested in the fact that you mentioned that you didn't really receive that much support, um, especially because many people didn't understand your rationale for changing and they also didn't see what you're going to do because they didn't understand it. And that brings me to... Um, what would you say to someone, say, who's 
in that position, they may be making a, a career decision at this point or trying to pivot. But um, so, you know, we always encourage people um, to seek mentorship, but maybe not everyone has access to mentorship. So how would you advise someone who doesn't really have a mentor or support system, but has to make such difficult decisions? What would you say to them? Oh, that's a good question. And, and, and I don't want to take responsibility for anybody who then listens to me and makes a bad decision. Um, <laughs> but I would say trust your instinct. I mean, your gut feeling is quite important and, and your passion. So if you're very passionate about something, then you're probably better off following that than not. Because you'll always think in the back of your head, what if I had done that? Because you loved it so much. Um, and you know, things work out some way or another for most of us, I'd say. Uh, if you do follow your passion, you will find your way through. Um, if you don't have a mentor, and, and I, I don't know, I think in the beginning of my career, I didn't really have many, much, much mentorship, is what I was told. Like, really, people were very, not very supportive. Um, but I just did what I thought I wanted to do. I just went for it, and um, I dove right in. And I think that was a bit, you know, when you're young, you're more likely to do that. I think now I'm, I, I, I have more reservations and I think things through a little bit more and I look at all the potential risks. But at that time, I really didn't have anything to lose. I thought, you know, if things go wrong, I can always come back. I can always go back, right? Because nobody really owns you. You can't, if you move now into a different career, you can always go back. Nothing is going to prevent you. So I think it's that. It's just not having that fear, making a mistake and just going for your passion, trying to trying to follow your, your instinct. Actually. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Thank you so much. And um, just to tap a bit into malaria and the research you're doing on vector control. So um, you mentioned that currently you have a study on using ivermectin, using mass drug administration of ivermectin to control malaria because um, uh, through mosquito control. But then you had I've also worked a bit on vector diversion and the ethics, the ethics behind um, repellents. So you mentioned that that work has not really been focused on a lot. So I'm just curious about um, malaria control in Africa and how we have had progress especially since the millennium, since 2000, early 2000s. But in recent years, we've seen stagnation in some countries and even increased incidence of malaria. And I would like to ask for your perspectives on that. Like, what are the new challenges that are coming up in malaria control that are leading to this very worrisome trends we're seeing? That's a great question, Anita. Um, well, the there are many things that are contributing to an increase or a plateau in that increase. It's, but one is resistance to insecticides. Um, there, is, there is thought that this is a huge threat to malaria control programs because programs are fully insecticide based. There's indoor residual spraying and then um, bag nets, but also the, the behavioral adaptation of vectors. Vectors are being favored to bite outdoors because, you know, all, everything that there is used against them is indoor based. So there's a lot of outdoor uh, transmission, sorry, but noise is so many. There's a lot of outdoor based transmission and there are interventions that are geared towards that. And one of them is indeed ivermectin because if you, if you take ivermectin and you, you, you are bitten by a mosquito, it doesn't matter what time that mosquito bites you or where, it will die. And so that study was really designed to address the so-called residual transmission, which is a transmission that occurs despite um, the full um, universal uh, coverage of bed nets and, or IRS. But there are other things that are fueling this, and globalization is definitely fueling it. And um, the, the fact that nowadays you can, in a few hours, you move between con continents and cargo moves between continents and, and also um, urbanization. So this the rapid urbanization and unplanned urbanization is also fueling this, and this is not just for malaria. So dengue, you also see that. But for malaria, you have now, you know, this Stephen's Eye invading Africa, and that is a combination of uh, urbanization and um, and globalization. But of course, this vector will require a totally different method of, of, of um, 
of control because it bites outdoors and it bites uh, at different times and and it's not going to be able to be controlled through the the regular uh, nets and IRS. So yeah, there's a lot that's going on and I think there's still room for a lot of research. I do think endectocytes are a great tool and there's probably more going to happen. The fact that more, more research is going to happen, the fact that diversion has not been looked at, it has to really to do with the fact that a lot of cluster randomized controlled trials looking at repellents didn't show an effect. So repellents have never really been never really kicked off as a um, as an intervention. Um, nowadays, there's talk there's more talk about special repellents because special repellents work in a different way. They don't just repel; they also inhibit feeding. Um, so there's just, just different uh, aspects of it that might not be so prone to uh, ethical issues like diversion. Thank you, uh, thank you, Marta. Um, if anyone has a question, just um, speak up so that it does not seem like <laughs> it's a one man show between Marta and I. But yeah, um, uh, just giving people space if anyone has a question or I can go with my next one. OK, let me ask one as people get ready. So um, one of the things that in, uh, I found interesting when looking through your Twitter or X profile is how vocal you are in celebrating the achievements of your students and your mentees every time they achieve something in their science career. And I'm just wondering, um, what, what motivates you to be such a strong advocate and supporter of others, especially given that, as you mentioned, you didn't receive that much support earlier on in your career? So what drives you to just be a very good cheerleader to your mentees as well? No, um, I think that's just it's just it's the way you should be. I don't know. Um, I think when my mentees or my students succeed, it's by proxy, it's my success as well. So I, maybe that's that's maybe you're not, not seeing the full picture. Maybe I'm just, you know, <laughs> it's me who I'm putting out there. Um, but no, uh, I, I really feel happy about it. I mean, it's an honest feeling. I feel so happy when they succeed. Um, all I want is for my students to, you know, reach the top that's for me that I don't I have a, quite a motherly feeling towards my students sometimes and I bet I annoy them um I like feel very protective about them and I do think our, our other researchers that would probably feel the same um but I do want them to succeed I honestly want them and I and I love seeing it and um it it means that I did something right and that validates my career path, that validates what I'm doing. Because if you work in global health and you're not going to do capacity building, then you're in the wrong job. You're totally in the wrong job. So I don't, I don't know if you were expecting something else. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. I agree with you that that's essentially, that's the way it's supposed to be. So I think more people should be like you. Um, so we normalize that support. We normalize that um, cheering each other on on this on this journey. And just um, so we're almost at the top of the hour, um, which we, we normally take an hour. And um, I'm just keeping a lookout for any questions. But if there are none, oh, Ruth, just go ahead before I ask my final question. Yes. Sure. Please. Uh, hi, Marta. Sorry if my voice is not sounding well. Uh, it's still very early here. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I, I think my question would be, what would you say has been the most rewarding aspect of your career so far? Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, all right. I mean, I, I don't know. My, um, having my students graduate is really rewarding that's that's super rewarding or or seeing them get their first grant has also been very rewarding. um and if you can look i mean i'm not i'm nothing there's nothing like writing a paper i actually I don't feel like papers are rewards and i hardly know if anybody reads them other than myself but i think Mm, it's that that's um, the impact that you have through capacity building has been for me the most rewarding part of my job. Yeah. And that's one thing I didn't talk about in my talk, and maybe I regret not adding it, which is failure. Um, should also normalize failure. Um, 
I mean, I showed you all of my grants that I got and my fellowships, but actually I've applied so many times to so many other funders and I never got, and I didn't get them. Uh, failure is normal. And um, sometimes I, I spoke a while back with somebody who's very successful. He's a, I'm not going to say who it is, but say he's, a, he's at the director level, right? And um, he told me he never got a fellowship his entire life. He applied and applied and applied, and he was rejected. And eventually the funder told him, don't apply again. We don't want to fund you. And, uh, and he made it through. So, I, and you know, people always, there's always these emails going around in institutes. Oh, congratulate so-and-so. They just got a fellowship. They just got a grant. But actually, um, nobody ever hears about when so-and-so didn't get a grant. Because sometimes you have to apply 10 times and you only get it once. So that failure, mm, there are some people, and I've seen this, that when they get a rejection, it really crumbles them and, and it, it, it causes them to not believe in themselves and it causes them to give up. And that is uh, that's exactly the opposite that should happen. What should happen is that you get up, get up again and apply again because you know, these things are so competitive. It doesn't mean that you didn't do a good job. It doesn't mean that you're not good enough. It just means that you, know, you didn't hit the right, the right funder and didn't pitch it in the right way. So failure, really, we should be talking more about failure um, and we should normalize them. Back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I especially like the last bit you talked about normalizing failure because we amplify a lot of successes and it may seem for someone who's starting out, it may seem as if it's automatic and it's obvious. And then once they get setbacks along the way and they're not used to seeing this, then they feel like it's only them. They feel like it's only you who's experiencing that. But we also need to amplify that out of the one application that succeeded, there was nine rejections out of it. So yeah, I really agree with that. Um, so on, as we finish, we normally like to um, advocate for trying to have a balance. And I'm glad that you emphasized a lot on how, one, it's not easy to have a balance between life and work and self. And just we are all striving to attain, attain that balance. And every day is just a struggle of trying to attain that. But we also like to acknowledge that it's good to detach from the science to just be you. And so my question to you is, what do you do for fun to unwind either after a day or when you're free? OK, <laughs> I spend time with my kids. It's going to be a very boring answer. Yeah, no, I spend time with my kids. I'll play a board game with my kids or something like that. Or I walk my dog. Um, for me, those are. Or I I sleep. <laughs> I love to sleep. Um, no, but if I have to do something, it will be really playing a board game with my children, walking my dog. Or, or I like to host people in my house if I have like a weekend and I will have people over and and you just spend socialize with my friends. So these are I think these are things that any normal person has. Yeah. I don't go skiing. Thank yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. I also sleep for fun and I'm glad I found someone who says that because some people usually don't agree when I say I sleep for fun. So yeah, um, this was so, so exciting, uh, Marta. Thank you so much for making the time um, away from your busy schedule and coming on here to vulnerably share your science journey. And I'm sure our audience was very appreciative as we are. And I would like to end our webinar at this point for today unless anyone has any question and to remind you that we normally have these webinars every two weeks so make sure to subscribe to our mailing list which i put on the chat and um, you'll get a personalized reminder on our next webinar as well as future opportunities thank you so much marta and thank you for everyone for joining us today i hope you enjoyed our webinar i will see you on the next one Thank you, Anita. Sorry if I, you know, made this very vulnerable and personal rather than, well, too much to the science. I, maybe I didn't get the memo. <laughs> no worries. No, 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 no at all. Uh, you actually did very well. That's literally what um, we are about because we like to talk about the science a bit, but also the personal, the human part of the science journey as well. So that was really, really um, great. Um, Stephen, your hand is up. Yeah, actually I wanted to... Uh, uh, I don't know if say 
the talk from Mata has been uh, more of a social, mostly people who are in science. We don't do uh, maybe a lot of family or politics. We just in our labs. But I like the way she has gone uh, and tried to show us how maybe we can balance between science and family. And every time she's saying about uh, talking about the kids and everything, uh, it's a challenge to us scientists who feel uh, it's only the lab and everything is lab. Yeah, so thank you so much, Mata. It has been a good time for me. Thank you, Stephen, Thanks. for that feedback. Yeah. <laughs>